Fucking nose. The problem child. <laughs> See that? Alien. Alien. That's the nose. Now next we're gonna take the hair off. Oh, oh no, no. I'm just trying to get some glue on. Here's the now tooth. It's... See this? Here's the fucking tooth. <laughs> Oops. No, Milton couldn't do nothing fast. <laughs> and now, the extremely cool and urbane Mr. Nichols. Thank you. Even without his makeup, Jack Nicholson was an exceptional character. A man who stood out in the crowd, an icon. A legendary actor who won three Oscars and dozens of other awards. A giant but one that people simply call Jack. The paradox of Jack is we know so much about him, uh, we feel so familiar, and yet at the same time, there are these sort of permanent mysteries about him. As well as you know him, he's still mysterious. A mystery kept up by the actor himself. He likes to keep us guessing. Unpredictable and elusive, Definitions tend to just slip off him. What kind of man am I? Over a 50-year career and more than 60 films, including some masterpieces, he's been friendly or disturbing, seductive or terrifying. But all of these roles, however different they were, had something in common. Through them, Jack Nicholson revealed himself. Ten minutes. Twelve, fifteen. We're recording. Um, How right. divorced from you, Jack Nicholson, the person, are you from yeah. your characters? Basically, I think one of the nice things about being an actor is, is that you get to really explore something. You know, you find something about yourself that you have in common with a character, and then you kind of dig at it and flop it out and throw it out. An intimate and personal exploration, straightforward for most actors, but which in Jack's case takes on a whole different dimension. Cinema is a blank page upon which he tells his story and reveals his dark side. Entering Jack Nicholson's filmography is like going on a treasure hunt where along the way you lose yourself in the maze in The Shining. In his many faces, he shows us fragments of his identity. This strange dialogue between Jack and his doubles began with his first film in 1958. There he is, folks. The boy with the gun. The crowd is going crazy. The police can't hold him back. In the skin of Jimmy Wallace, he was already playing the person he was in reality. A young man of 21 years of age, not too comfortable in the skin he was in, suffocating in his provincial town. Spring Lake, New Jersey. A small town on a flat stretch of Atlantic coastline that still today exudes a quiet air of conformity and boredom. It was in this world that Jack Nicholson grew up in a family of modest means. In this photo taken in 1954, from his high school archives, he was 17. A brilliant pupil who had skipped a grade, but he has an awkward smile. He was a shy, sensitive boy, and this part of Jack really, I would say, still exists, meaning it's buried, buried, buried under the great movie star now. But he was Catholic and he had gone through um, the church, Holy Communion and being an altar boy. It's a kind of um, angelic boy, really. But by the time he gets to high school, it's really not cool to be that kind of person.
He started to be more of a, you know, to sort of have the facade of a delinquent and to get thrown out of classes and be kind of lippy with the teachers. We were in the same class together, uh, you know, hung around with the same people. He was a real big talker. He was always disrupting the class with his trying to do some sort of an anic or teasing somebody uh, because he wanted to be liked, but he was very chubby, and that was one of his nicknames, Chubby. He had a great smile. It's like, I'm Jack, like me. He kind of forces the world to love him, and most of the world does. At a young age, Jack understood what was going to become the big motivator in his life, pretending to be someone else. He was already growing out of Spring Lake. In 1955, he got a job lifeguarding. At the end of the season, he was out of work, nothing to do. He borrowed some money from a friend of ours, got a car, and he drove himself out there. Most of the people in that high school were going to stay in that town or in that area forever, and they were going to inherit the lives of their parents in various ways. And uh, he wanted to make a break with New Jersey, and he went to Hollywood in California. One day he's there, the next day he's not. At 18 years old, Jack drove alone across the United States, fleeing the destiny that had been traced out before him. In Hollywood, he was just another young hit guy with no money. One among thousands. But in secret, he was dreaming big. He got a first job at MGM, you know, as a runner for the animation department. That means you run with messages and you go get this, go get that, go get coffee. You know, that was a great job because you could walk around the studio and see the films being made. Uh, he loved it. He wanted to get into the movies, and then he said, but I can never tell any of the guys back home that, because they tease me to death, because no guys were going to go out to California and become movie stars. It was the time of James Dean and Marlon Brando. Jack had to escape from the confined atmosphere and sarcasms of his hometown in order to try to reinvent himself. But at the Hollywood Dream Factory, he was sorely lacking in star attributes. Physiquement, euh, il n'a pas le physique d'un jeune premier, Jack Nicholson. Il a une calvitie naissante très très tôt. Euh, il a un bassin un, un peu développé. Il a une démarche un peu lourde. Son physique est encore trop atypique, trop imparfait pour trouver sa place dans le cinéma américain dès la fin des années 50. I think we better be going, Bob. Why? Your mother and father aren't going to worry about you now. Not a week away from our wedding. En plus, il a une voix qu'il a jamais beaucoup aimée d'ailleurs au début. On l'a souvent reproché. On trouvait un peu nasillarde, un peu type redneck du Midwest américain. They said, well, with that voice, you have a New Jersey twang. Your voice is too high. You're not going to make it in the movies. In spite of everything, Jack became an actor, playing small role after small role in movies and on television. It seemed as if he never quite fitted in. There was something about his face that just wasn't quite right. When Jack was sent out for parts, he would send out two kinds of photographs. One was him looking very clean cut, the boy next door. And in the other one, he'd be like brooding, like, you know, the James Dean surly delinquent, neither of which he is exactly. It took him a while to figure out what he was exactly on the screen. In his early films you did, did people cast you in one particular type? No, they didn't. Uh, at the time, I ardently wished that they did, because it would have meant they knew who I was, no less what type I was. <laughs> Is this Dr. Farb's office? 
One filmmaker understood long before the others Jack's singularity. The B-movie director Roger Corman, the Pope of pop cinema, offered him a small role that broke with the conventions of the time. What made Jack special and different from the other young actors of the time was that he was a very intelligent, very sharp, and had a kind of a quirky sense of humor. Oh, goody, goody, here it comes. <laughs> oh, my God, don't stop now! In the role of this masochistic patient, Jack got back to the clowning he used to do at school. Doing that sort of thing, he was bound to go down well. Jack was doing what he always does. He was playing himself. He was taking the written script, the dialogue, the character, and making that character himself. His eyes glittering like those of a maniac. None of the three movies Jack made with Roger Corman gave him a really decisive role. Shoots of just a few days with pathetically low budgets, but they were an opportunity for the young actor. Corman gave him carte blanche and, above all, didn't try to make him conform. It was from this production company on the penniless outskirts of the American film industry that the future of movies was about to spring. Starting in the late 50s, the 60s, Hollywood was going through something of a change. The major studios were losing some of their power. The independents were coming up. Roger Corman, c'est quelqu'un qui va avoir l'intelligence d'héberger l'essentiel des talents à venir de la génération des années 60-70, qui s'appelle Coppola, Scorsese, Monty Hennemann, Jonathan Demi, Denis Hopper, Peter Fonda, Bruce Dern, Jack Nicholson. La liste est immense. We were all young, we were friends, we were to a certain extent competitors. We were all part of a, a new movement in Hollywood. In this heady atmosphere, Jack began at last to flourish. On Corman's shoots, he familiarized himself with the skills of the different professions that go into making a movie. His horizons broadened, his ambition too. We were both much more attracted to European filmmaking than we used to go every time Kubrick had a film, every time Olmi, every time Godard or Truffaut or somebody had a film, we would just run to it. And then we would just spend endless hours planning to try to figure out how we were going to get to direct. C'est un type cultivé, Nicholson, qui s'intéressait au non-sens de la vie, à son absurdité, grand fan du mythe de Sisyphe de Camus. C'est le moment où la culture européenne infuse cette nouvelle génération, on pourrait dire, d'acteurs, d'artistes américains. Et il se dit, ben, moi, je vais commencer à écrire. The intelligence that he'd taken pains to cover up since his teenage years would at last come out in his writing. His first screenplay in 1964 revealed a darker, more tormented side of his personality. You know anything about death? Death? Yeah, you know, death. Are you interested in death? It's something that we all go through at least once. He was a terrific writer. Jack, everything he touched, he was really good at. And he didn't get credit for it for because he, because he was too interested in making serious films and not just commercial mainstream stuff. He was caught, like a lot of us were, between wanting to make films that worked for bigger audiences and wanting to try to find some more, something more truthful. For these new filmmakers, movies had to reflect the upheavals of the times they were living through. As the USA got bogged down in the Vietnam War, American youth took to the streets in a climate of race riots, political defiance and sexual revolution. All of society's values were thrown into question. Ready? One, two, three, four. Times were changing, his roles too. But Jack Nicholson still didn't have the right face for the job. All right, okay, that's all right. I, I, gotta, I gotta take a break now, I'm tired. At the age of 31, he was already a bit old to be credible in the role of a young hippie. It was starting to be ridiculous. He had no intention of acting anymore, you know. Or he said, no, no, I'm giving this up. I'm just gonna direct. I'm not, I can't go through this anymore. 
Even though he was a big fan of joints and hallucinogenic trips, Jack still didn't belong to the counterculture world. Old D.H. Lawrence. And it was precisely because he was out of sync with that world that he would be such a hit in 1969 against all expectations. Indians. In theory, Easy Rider was just another B-movie, but it revolutionized American cinema. The heroes of this road movie were two guys from the margins of American society, confronted with conservative and racist middle America. Jack didn't belong to either of these worlds, but in a tiny role with less than 50 minutes on the screen, he took the movie hostage. The irony was that he was pulled into Easy Rider against his wishes to act in the part which he didn't want to act in, and that turned his whole career around. C'est le personnage qu'on remarque, mais c'est qui ce type qui joue le rôle de l'alcoolique et déclipse totalement Peter Fonda et Denis Hopper parce que eux jouent à peine en fait. Puis ils fumaient de la marijuana pendant le tournage, c'était un tournage assez épique, le tournage d'Easy Rider, mais Jack Nicholson est génial. Amen. Oh, we represent to them, man, as somebody who needs a haircut. Oh. What you represent to them is freedom. At 32, and for the first time in his career, Jack found himself in a role that truly matched who he was. Intelligent, original, and a little bit crazy. Me, 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 me. Swamp. How did you respond to your character in the film? Oh, I, I liked my character the minute that I read it right away. I felt like he was a character sort of out of control internally, but on, had a very good view of the outside. You know, some, he was a little wacky at times, but uh, a lot in the character I could very easily get behind myself. Like George Hansen, um, he's a loser in America. He doesn't believe in the American dream. Uh, and then uh, throughout the entire rest of his career, almost without exception, he plays losers. And he reflected a whole generation of uh, people who were not like the people before and somehow very idiosyncratic, very much their own unique individual. He was the right person at the right time. Academy Award Show. A gripping reflection of its time, Easy Rider instantly achieved cult status and thrust Jack Nicholson into the limelight. Produced for a few hundred thousand dollars, the film made millions and would lead to a radical shake-up in Hollywood. D'un seul coup, on va donner à toute cette génération de cinéastes et de réalisateurs, etc., les clés d'Hollywood en disant, écoutez, nous, on ne sait plus trop comment ça fonctionne, mais visiblement, vous avez trouvé quelque chose. Il suffit d'avoir les cheveux longs, de, de, de sentir un peu le joint et de dire, je vais faire un film pour qu'il vous donne l'argent pour le faire. After Easy Rider, Jack knew he had struck gold. He got his Oscar nomination, uh, so there's no waiting time. He's immediately a star, and he was all ready to be a star. Fifteen years after his arrival in Los Angeles, the man who called himself a New Jersey hick reached the summit of Hollywood's Mount Olympus. He went to live among the other stars on Mulholland Drive, ready to live the life. I remember Jack was excited. He said, I got a house right next to Brando. He liked that idea. I mean, Brando meant everything to our generation. He was sort of an icon in our minds. But Jack let the chance to make a film with his idol pass him by. The offers were coming thick and fast now, and he could afford to pick and choose. You turned down both The Godfather and The Sting. Is that true? Yes, that's true. Uh, Godfather was going to be a good film. I'd always wanted to work with Marlon, but the, uh, I was asked to play the lead in it. And A, I felt it should be an Italian person. And B, didn't have any scenes with Marlon in the script I read. So that's why I turned that down in The Sting. As I say, it was because the ones that I did at that period of time, I happened to like more. 
Jack has always been very, very, uh, uh, I'd say, um, determined about forging his own self-image. He really began to define himself as a kind of outsider in Hollywood, even though he's the ultimate insider. And he wanted to do characters that were on the cusp of what was acceptable in terms of language and sex as a form of exploring himself and revealing himself to the public as much as he cares to. Now that he had the power to do what he wanted, he chose to play an art house film such as Antonioni's Profession Reporter, intimate, even underground works that cut against his status as a star. He exposed himself little by little by playing these roles that were made for him, subversive, close to who he really was. Do you miss me? Uh, yes. Yes, I have missed you. Do you want to know why? Because you're very simple-minded. Screw you. <laughs> In the film made by his friend Henry Jaglom, he got into the skin of Mitch, a sharp-tongued and world-weary Don Juan who resembled him like a brother. The character's based on him. Not just that he played it, I wrote it with him in mind. Because he was Mitch, because he was a man who was extremely attractive to women, and he was not going to commit very much at that point in his life, and he was the opposite of whatever monogamous is, and uh, dangerous, because he would come and make a woman very uh, excited and very happy, and then he'd leave. The ungainly kid of his early years now seemed a long way away. Jack was a transformed man. They now called him the Great Seducer. His first and only marriage lasted just five years. Now that he'd become irresistible, he became insatiable. You're a real brick, you know that. Brick. In carnal knowledge, did you draw on your own experience with women? Naturally. I mean, naturally. I mean, I. I will draw on my own experience with women in every part I play. <laughs> what is your own experience with women? <laughs> What's my own experience with women? Lot, I've had a lot of experience with them so far. Pretty good so far. Not exactly modest, the great seducer, but behind the carnivorous smile was hidden a much less glorious past. Things hadn't always been easy between Jack and women, his compulsive need to seduce sometimes seemed like revenge. Jack arrives from New Jersey undoubtedly a virgin. He did not arrive in Hollywood as the great seducer. He arrived as a kid who uh, had never had a serious relationship with a girl. Um, he also says in many interviews that he was bad at sex. You know, he was a premature ejaculator. Later on, when he starts having girlfriends and starts going to therapy, and then he said, you know, I thought when I was having girlfriends and when I was in bed with them, I was always uh, in bed with my mom. I was measuring them up to my mom. It would take years for Jack to overcome this cumbersome Oedipus complex. Meanwhile, it was difficult to rival his mother. Ethel May was a strong-willed woman. She had raised her son on her own. Jack's father, an alcoholic, disappeared immediately after he was born. To make ends meet, she opened a hair salon on the ground floor of their house in Spring Lake. My mother used to go to his mother's salon for hairdressing. I remember it being a big place with these big hair dryers, uh, smelled a lot because it was permanent wave, and if you ever smelled permanent wave, you'd remember it all your life. But her papa doesn't let you come in. I was sitting in the chair, and Jack came out while she was doing the hair and wanted money to go to the movie. She said, not now, I'm busy, I can't get you the money. I have been to many tropic ports. I might include even Brooklyn. So he goes into the other room and comes back out with her purse. 
Now, he's being persistent, and that's Jack. She gives him the money. Jack smiles, his smile that he even had then. Like to see, see that's how it's done. So take a trip and on a ship go sailing away. Jack spent his childhood in an exclusively feminine world between the customers in the hair salon, his mother, and his two elder sisters, Lorraine and June. Jack was a spoiled kid. I mean, they fondled him, they created him, they pampered him, they groomed his hair, pudgy little roly poly, powdered and perfumed Jack. That's what he looked like. He looked like he was just a pampered kid. He was raised by these women who just fawned over him, and whatever tantrums or transgressions he made as a, as a boy, they were very quick to forgive. He can be mischievous, he can be very angry. Whatever he does, um, he gets nothing back but love. Lacking paternal authority, Jack didn't know his limits. This overprotected and tyrannical little boy was submerged by a deep rage that nothing could pacify. See this sign? Jack drew deeply on this long-felt need and transposed his rage into his roles. I am the motherfucking shore patrol, motherfucker! I am the motherfucking shore patrol! Give this man a beer. His sister Lorraine, for her part, found it disturbing to see him up on the screen. Is this an ultimatum or not? Because if it is, I'm gonna tell you what you can do with your ultimatum. I'm gonna tell you what you can do with it! You can make this goddamn Movies offered him a way to exercise his past to make amends. Bobby Dupee, the hero of five easy pieces who had fled his background and his family, attempted to make things up with his father. Were there echoes of your relationship with your own father in that film? That was a sort of a, a very much an intimate family-like experience. But there, it's a, essentially, uh, interestingly enough, uh, I feel an anti-family movie. I get very sad behind it, if you want to know the truth, when I think about it, because it causes a lot of illusion. It gives people enormous emotional problems to deal with, you know, long into their younger adult life and maybe forever. To work his way out of his own suffering, Jack made a point of writing the reunion monologue himself, like a desire to reconcile himself with the father who had abandoned him. I don't know what to say. <laughs> Tina suggested that we try to, but I don't know. I think that she, I think that she feels that we've got some understanding to reach. <sighs> with this role, Jack thought he'd settled his score with the past. After five movies nourished by some very personal wounds, the moment had come for him to turn the page. The introspection was over. It was genre film time. You're a very nosy fellow, kitty cat, huh? You know what happens to nosy fellows? Chinatown was a homage to the private detective movies of the 1930s. In appearance, nothing in common with Jack's life. But only in appearance. Jake Gittes' investigation confronted him with a dark family drama. By an extraordinary coincidence, this piece of fiction echoed the cataclysm that was about to upturn the actor's own life. In 1974, just after the film's release, a journalist unearthed a secret that was completely unknown to Jack. Jack's sister June was, in reality, his mother. When he was born, she was a teenager. She left school to become a music hall dancer. A bold and pretty girl, she fell pregnant when she was 16, probably unsure who the father was. 
Unafraid of the scandal, Ethel May took things in hand. She sent June to New York to have the baby, made it known that the baby was her own and imposed a pact on her daughters never to reveal the truth. This is in 1937. Uh, it's a Catholic area of New Jersey, so it would be a tremendous shame and social burden to be a single mother out of wedlock. Instead, they carried on this family charade. However, he now knows uh, that he has no idea who his father is and that his uh, that June died without ever saying anything to him. Why? Ethel May died without saying anything to him. Why? I said I want the truth. She's my sister. She's my daughter. My sister, my daughter. I said I want the truth. No. She's my sister and my daughter. <laughs> The character played by Faye Dunaway bears an eerie resemblance to June, Jack's sister and mother. By what incredible flute did this movie script correspond with his own family history? Escaping his control, reality contaminated fiction. But unlike the character he played in the film, Jack got no answers to his questions. Jack is floored. He's floored. Um, there are stories that he hired private detectives, that he tried to figure out what actually happened. He tried to figure out who his father was. Um, so it shook him, and I think being Jack, it probably still shakes him, you know, to his dying day. And, you know, I think when you get to the next films, you see a guy, uh, you know, kind of uh, falling apart emotionally, psychologically, physically in roles. The exposure of this family lie liberated in Jack Nicholson something dark. A silent fury that would, little by little, start to dominate his roles. And curiously, it was in a real psychiatric hospital that it started to come out. <laughs> Pretending to be mad, the hero of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest wreaks havoc. Playing this role was a great outlet for the actor. Immersed in a troupe where the actors were mixed with mentally ill people, he abandoned himself to what director Milos Forman asked of his actors, telling them to improvise. Jack exceeded expectations. He was on the set, just sitting around with Danny DeVito and you know, others improvising. And Every time they, they improvised it, going back and starting over again three or four times, and each time, Nicholson, all his choices were appropriate, they fit. And in each take, they were really different. You know, it was like I uh, was really witnessing somebody who knew what he was doing. All right, here's Tresh is the next batter. Tresh looks in, Kofax. Calling on his own passion for baseball, Jack Nicholson invented, there and then, the commentary of an imaginary match. <laughs> on the set, he ended up identifying completely with this anarchist, stubborn rejection of authority, embodied here by the terrible Nurse Ratched. Would you like to rest today, or would you like to join the group? Uh. Oh, I'd love, love to join the group. I, I'd like, I'm proud to join the group, Mildred. <clears throat> At a certain point, no one could tell when the actor was being himself and when he was playing the role. I think they're both uh, rebels. You know, I feel from, you know, from his gut, they can't fuck with them. So I can't imagine anybody else bringing that kind of life that he brought to it, and depth. Lee Strasberg used to say to us, you know, if you need to work, you gotta do the work. But sometimes you just need to be there because what you are is the work. That was Jack. All right, ready? Action. With this scene, Jack took catharsis to its limit. 
It was as if Nurse Ratched was paying for all the women who had betrayed him. And a winner is Jack Nicholson and one He'd run the risk of exposing himself utterly on screen. No holding back. Now Jack Nicholson picked up the big prize, his first Oscar in 1976, and from Hollywood, unanimous recognition. Well, uh, I guess this proves there are as many nuts in the Academy as anywhere else. <laughs> Easy Rider had made him a star, one flew over the cuckoo's nest made him an icon, the icon of the perfect rebel. On the eve of his 40th birthday, Jack Nicholson had everything a man could wish for. Hi, darling. It's toots. No, I'm, they just want to know when I'm coming for dinner. Anything's fine with me. OK, darling. See you later. Bye. Um, who's toots? Angelica. Angelica was Angelica Houston, daughter of the director John Houston. She met Jack in 1973 and caught herself Hollywood's most supercharged playboy. She's a princess of the kingdom. Jack is from the Jersey North Shore. He understood immediately who she was and the lineage with her father, John Houston, and I think that flattered him. For Jack, John Huston represented much more than a great filmmaker. He was a masculine role model, even a substitute father. He shared his taste for cigars and beautiful women and an aversion for fidelity. Jack continued to um, see other women. Some were just one night flings. Some were famous people. Some were waitresses. Angelica was very, very tolerant. She had a, a worse role model in her father, and she understood guys that are tough to live with. She was made for him. They were perfect together. Jack Nicholson had found the ideal woman, and yet... Mm. Neither love, nor fame were able to satisfy his gnawing need for something else. He always needed more and then some. The 1980s began as the decade of all the excesses. C'est un jouisseur Jack Nicholson, c'est un drôle de mélange entre d'un côté un insatisfait absolument chronique et un jouisseur. Jack has always believed in daytime and nighttime, in work time and play time, which is parties, drugs, women. He's always been very, very shrewd about understanding how that makes him happy and keeps him going. En fait, il y a un côté sale gosse chez Jack Nicholson parce que l'impulsion de départ, c'est qu'il ne veut pas être comme on lui dit qu'il faut être. Et cette insatisfaction-là, elle est intéressante parce que dans Nicholson, c'est toujours ce qu'il ne veut pas, mais il n'a aucune idée, finalement, de ce qu'il désire vraiment. Testing the limits, always seeking to go further. In this endless quest, the movies became the place where he metamorphosed. This time, no question of being himself, still less of pretending. Jack was ready to slip into madness once and for all. But that's the best approach to have, you know, never be satisfied, never get lazy, always be reaching out. That's what an actor's about trying something that you haven't tried before. You know, the, the, the really tasty part of the craft is uh, you can just be someone else, and the more convincingly you are that other person, the better you've done your job. What better antidote to his own trauma than to become that other Jack, that wicked double, who slides into insanity and attempts to assassinate his family? Directed by Stanley Kubrick, Jack entered a new dimension on every level. The Shining, de fait, c'est un film bascule. 
parce que bosser pour Stanley Kubrick, c'est une sorte de Graal pour à peu près tous les acteurs américains. D'ailleurs, il va y consacrer un an, un an et demi. Le tournage est extrêmement long, les prix sont incalculables, le perfectionnisme de Stanley Kubrick est fou. He told me that um, Kubrick kept saying, do it again, do it again, do it again. And Jack thought, well, he's going to modulate, he's going to prove, pick this take here and this take, and that he picked all the top takes where he was most extreme. And Jack was not thrilled with that at the time, but he gave it his all, and Kubrick kept saying, more, bigger, bigger. Please! Stop swinging the bat. The actor didn't need a hundred takes to take things to extremes. He was himself on the verge of losing it altogether. During that 11-month shoot, he oscillated between exhausting days of work and nights of debauchery. But at the end of his nighttime revels, he always arrived punctually on the set. <laughs> He got high a lot, but he didn't do it while he was working. Jack, excellent. So he, it was very under control for Jack. He always knew how to cut it off before work, even cut it off before dinner. Come on, you Come on, The absolute terror that Jack Torrance inspires doubtless came as much from the Kubrick method as it did from the physical and mental state of an actor harassed from inside by his demons. Here's Johnny! With this film, the actor smashed his image into little bits. America's favorite anti-hero became its worst nightmare, and Jack Nicholson entered for good into movie legend. Le sourire de Jack Nicholson, à ce moment-là, coincé dans la porte, s'imprime définitivement dans l'imaginaire collectif. Ça va devenir un passage de bande dessinée, mais aussi un personnage de jeu vidéo, un personnage pour de, qui va inspirer des groupes de rock. Ça va devenir un, presque un logo de t-shirt. Et Nicholson, ça devient ça. C'est-à-dire l'homme du sourire, de la grimace, des sourcils qui se relèvent. Il devient un super-héros de lui-même. C'est une scène de superstar de lui-même. On va voir un film de Nicholson, comme on va voir un film de Bruce Willis ou de Stallone. On va voir Nicholson en train de faire sa performance. Euh, donc il n'est plus que, le, presque dire, la caricature, mais au sens strict du, du terme. Il n'est plus que l'image figée de lui-même. Of that caricature, Jack Nicholson was very much the author. Never taken in by himself, he pushed it to the limit. Jack. Jack is dead, my friend. You can call me Joker. And as you can see, I'm a lot happier. Yet another Jack, a Baroque psychopath who was the logical climax of an escalation that had begun 15 years earlier in the asylum in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. <laughs> This iconic comic strip bad guy was only waiting for Nicholson to come to life. His creator, Bob Kane, had himself colored the photo of the smile and the shining, disturbed by the obvious similarity. Jack, as a boy, collected comics. He loved comic books. It gave him a chance to play a boyhood figure that still loomed in his imagination. It gave him a chance to have tremendous fun as an actor because one of the things we like about Jack are the roles in which he romps. Boo! <laughs> <laughs> With Batman, Jack Nicholson reached heights where the oxygen is thin and heads start to spin. His financial pretensions were as excessive as his performance. Jack had a contract that said if this movie is incredibly, incredibly successful and we have endless number of sequels, Jack Nicholson gets some, something for that because he will have helped elevate the movie into a vent. Jack, where are you going? Daddy's going to make some art, darling. never seen before, kicking off the Batman franchise around the world. Jack pocketed the tidy sum of $60 million, unheard of at that time. 
That role made him the best paid actor in Hollywood. Now his nickname was The Money. And I'm sure he probably gave the term to himself affectionately, I am the money. He asked for the biggest price in town because he's the biggest star, the biggest name with the most number of Oscar nominations whose name will bring people into theaters in a picture of that sort. Triumphant at 50, Jack Nicholson had distanced all his rivals. Adulated like a living god, he received more awards and honours than any other actor of his generation. He had nothing left to prove, nothing left to hope for. Although, behind the mask of success, he hid in reality a secret frustration, the bitterness of failure. Une des grandes déceptions ou blessures de Jack Nicholson, c'est que c'est quelqu'un qui s'est euh, imaginé comme un grand acteur, ce qu'il est devenu. Euh, qui s'est imaginé comme un scénariste important, il a collaboré à des scénarios importants et a pu aussi s'imaginer comme quelqu'un qui pouvait réaliser des films et aucun des films qu'il a réalisés n'a marché. En 1991, Jack Nicholson tried to take advantage of his triumph in Batman to achieve a youthful ambition, directing the sequel to Chinatown. The Two Jakes was the third film he directed in 20 years. Like the two previous attempts, the movie was an abject failure. I remember on the set of uh, The Two Jakes, he said something to me which killed me, actually. He said, if this one doesn't work, that's it. I said, what? What are you talking about? You're young, what are you, what, why? He said, what's the point? I think he got trapped in stardom when you get huge commercial success on the other side by acting. And you can make a fortune and it's easier to act than to direct. You figure, why, why put myself against this again and again? And I've always been a little sad for him uh, that he didn't become the filmmaker that I think he could have been a wonderful, significant filmmaker. It was the price to pay for the glory he dreamed of Jack had become the prisoner of a character called Nicholson. For the two decades that followed, the actor took no more risks. He was often great, he was never really surprising. You've got something you wanna ask me? As the years went by, he continued tirelessly to keep up the illusion of an always unpredictable Jack. How about this, huh? Always uncontrollable, always irresistible. Jack only scrambled out that trap of appearances at the last minute thanks to Sean Penn. He saw something of himself in this young actor who had got behind the camera, who had succeeded in doing what he'd failed to do. And Jack let Penn use his own life as inspiration to write the screenplay that would finally free him from his own caricature. Like Freddie Gale, the hero of The Crossing Guard, Jack had lost the love of his life out of weakness. For 17 years, Angelica Houston put up with all the vices and infidelities of her infernal lover. Even his sexual prowess revealed in the pages of Playboy in 1989 by one of his conquests. Eventually, uh, he gets a young actress uh, pregnant, and uh, that became public in a very, I would say, humiliating way to Angelica Houston, and they had a very definite breakup. I think the lack of committing to Angelica is a little sadness in Jack's life that he would acknowledge, and nobody was ever as close for as long, no female, um, with Jack. We had a good one, didn't we? Yes. Good times. No hidden agendas. None of the nasty bullshit you see with other people. With The Crossing Guard, the actor's life and fiction telescoped one more time. It will be the last. 
Jack Nicholson only let his nostalgia and his regrets filter through on the screen. In public, he appeared happy with his new girlfriend, Rebecca Broussard, with whom he made a late bid to build a family life. But the happiness was an illusion. He was incapable of living in a couple. Past master in the art of false pretenses, Jack Nicholson only gives to others the appearance they expect of him. His legendary smile, his irremovable dark glasses, his image. Jack always understood that wearing those glasses that bar you from, you know, looking into his soul, um, that particularly out in public, that's where the wall is. He made a statement about that. He goes, without the sunglasses, I'm just an old, fat, bald man. With the sunglasses, I'm Jack Nicholson. I want to read a quote to you that a friend of yours uh, allegedly spoke about you. He's profoundly lonely, permanently alienated, absolutely brilliant, and the nature of his brilliance confirms his isolation because it's the kind that's very hard to touch. He forces himself to escape from himself. You know, my recurring fantasy as an actor has always been that I would be in the trunk in the gutter somewhere by myself, disgraced for some reason. You know, that's the ultimate fear. Hmm. And so in that way, I keep the ability to be alone alive. And uh, I don't know if that's smart or wise or what, but I do know that it seems to be a part of my nature. Nothing really distinguishes the actor from Jerry Black, the hero of The Pledge. Behind the mask, Jack Nicholson is a man alone. C'est quelqu'un qui se rend compte que finalement au bout de tout ça il y a rien, que le désir est vide. Qu'en fait, il y a jamais de solution, il y a jamais d'Éden, il y a jamais de paradis et à la fin la seule solution c'est de prendre congé ou de disparaître. c'est ça le, le devenir du personnage de Nicholson. Since his last film in 2010, Jack Nicholson has deserted the screen, preferring to keep the remainder of his life secret. The last giant of Hollywood is putting the final touch on his legend. All that remains is his image and the unfathomable mystery of his soul.